Hey guys, what's up? Aru. Honkai Star Rail. <laughs> Finally, this video is every single planet of the Honkai Star Rail universe in kind of a nutshell, kind of an explained video. I'll be discussing the lore of each planet, what they're like, what happened to them, and which race lives there. A bit of in-game lore, a bit of what's to come in the next patches, but mostly the lore of each of the game's planets. Honkai Star Rail's universe is still pretty new really new. And there's a lot of different terminologies, names, titles, wababoo, we hear about in-game, but aren't really explained in full. They say, oh, this planet used to be okay back then, but now it's covered in snow and there's this big old fire planet and everyone wants to destroy things. There's this robot planet here. These guys have planet-sized ships and this planet doesn't spin. What's happening? Where do I start? Well, this video is particularly for you or those of you who have a bit of knowledge of the game and are interested in the different planets within Star Rail. I won't be discussing every Aeon since that's not what this is about, and Aeons themselves deserve a video of their own. I'm gonna give a nice overview of the different planets within the Honkai Star Rail universe. The people on each planet, and maybe an Aeon or two depending on if they do worship an Aeon or not, as well as how the entire planet reflects the game as a whole. Sound good? Okay, let's go. So if you didn't already know, we had a planet to go to after the Yarilo 6 arc. And it's a little planet called Panaconi. This planet was supposed to be the scheduled and planned destination of our Trailblaze journey after Yarilo 6. But we had a lovely call from our Celeron Hunter friends. Himiko, the actual conductor of the express, was about to set our next journey for Panaconi. And right before we traveled, we were hit up by Kafka saying that there's a Celeron on a nearby planet-sized ship the Shanzo Lofu, leading us to the entire Lofu arc. Basically, we went there because Elio, aka Destiny's slave, says that we were meant to go there, and everything was all according to the Stellaron Hunters' ultimate plan. What exactly is that plan? I have no idea. He could be making the biggest rickroll in the name of Aha. But back to Penacani. When Akavili was still alive, Panaconi used to be a sort of prison planet of the IPC. TLDR, the IPC or Inter Astral Peace Corporation, is basically the biggest galactic trade company ever, devoted to trading as many items for building materials and giving it to Klipoth, their Aeon god, who's building a wall at the center of the IPC galaxy. Don't worry, we'll talk about where Klipoth is on the next planet. Back to Panaconi, it is a planet where they exile criminals, aka bad people. An entire planet used as a prison, a prison planet where all of the criminals go to by the IPC. Okay, this isn't Impel Down, this isn't the great prison or the prison of the universe, at least not yet. There could actually be more of these planets. There are quite possibly multiple galaxies in Star Rail and this single planet can't be the only prison planet. Not to mention, that's just the IPC. Maybe Shanzo has a boat prison, and maybe the Genius Society has a prison for mad scientists. Uh, we don't know. Star Rail. Now, at some point, Panaconi was corrupted by a Stellaron, likely from Nanook, the Aeon of Destruction, when he started spreading these all over the universe. Not the galaxy, the universe. Those are two different things. And the IPC lost control of Panaconi. So, what happened to the planet that was possibly filled with the most dangerous criminals that the IPC caught? The same planet corrupted by a Stellaron that might end up infested by Stellaron corruption, aka Fragmentum? Well, you'll never guess what happened next. They joined the nicest and possibly the most pacifist Aeon in existence. Shipe, Zaip, XIPE, this here, the Aeon of Harmony accepted the entire prison planet filled with criminals of who knows what they were doing before they got there and made them a member of the family, which is the faction that is devoted to her, them, it, that. Here's a quote, Odes of Harmony, Opus, OP. 7. The world is in harmony and the stars shine bright. Praise the Lord! All are connected and the wind of blessing breathes across the lands. This is what happened to the prison planet that was infested by criminals and was also infested by the cancer of worlds. What, what happened? A planet of criminals doing a complete 180 and preaching that the universe will one day sing in harmony and 
start praising an aeon they even have a title called the planet of festivities okay this is the same planet where they store murder <laughs> this is the same planet where they store bad people okay really bad people and they're now the planet of festivities like isn't it just unsettling how crazy and miraculous that sounds and isn't it also unsettling that an Aeon can do this sort of thing to merely a single planet? For the sake of power scaling and seeing how powerful an Aeon is, the Lord Ravager, Zephyro, an emanator of destruction, destroyed an entire galaxy. A galaxy, okay? It, a galaxy has a lot of planets inside it. At least according to the morning actors, which uh, uh, I wouldn't believe it. But even Welt believes that statement. So imagine what an Aeon can do. An entire planet of exiles, criminals, and overall not so nice people completely converted by Zype, an Aeon of Harmony, and is now inviting other galactic factions for the first time in Panacani's lifetime as a member of the family. Like, I don't know what's coming when we get here, but we're going there. That's where we're supposed to go right after Yarilo 6. So we're probably gonna go there after Shanzo in like 1.3? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. But I'm really scared of what we're going to find in Panacani. Here's a sort of interview with the family. People are curious whether any members of the family had grown tired of the one and voluntarily abandoned the Path of Harmony. In the face of such a question, the family smiles and replies, Never. The family smiles, and it's not a representative, not the president or whatever. It's the family as a whole. Like a lot of people saying the same phrase, Never. Panacani, and the family as well. Now, I'm pretty sure we won't be going to the Antimatter Legion's planet anytime soon since Nanook right now is the protagonist of the game, but it's a great introduction to how messed up an Aeon's blessing can be. The Warforge is, in a sense, a forge planet, or forge world. Now, I sound like I'm taking cues from a certain game, but the Warforge, in its name, is a planet of forging. And not just conventional weapons and armor blessed by Nanook either. They create living weapons out of living beings. Yeah. The Fire Smiths, which we'll talk about in a bit, used the Antimatter Legion, creatures or living things who craved and longed for the separation of material existence and to be one with the destruction that Nanook himself stands for. All of the Antimatter Legion were used voluntarily <laughs> as raw materials by the Firesmiths to recreate the Antimatter Legion. They used themselves as materials for making weapons. This is how fanatical and zealous the main forces of the Aeon of Destruction are. They're willing to be destroyed and remade into instruments of destruction. And they roam the universe, destroying everything in the name of destruction. We haven't even gone over the Firesmitch, which are both blessed and cursed by Nanook. They were freed from the shackles of the so-called Prison Masters, who wanted the power of firesmithing for themselves, and then gave them this world filled with volcanoes of unending heat and flame and blessed them with the mark of destruction so they could forge and keep forging to their heart's desire but this blessing of forging to their heart's desire became another prison H here's the best way to summarize the firesmiths flesh and blood are a burden forging is also destruction the chief looked at the ever-growing number of deformed firesmiths and lamented like this guy Zhao ulted himself into forging weapons this is how twisted and messed up an aeon can bestow their so-called blessings and this is what the path of destruction is and what the planet of destruction is there you go the warforge now that we're done with destroying things, let's talk about building things. Pure point to my understanding is a megastructure or a planetary stockpile where all of the IPC, inter astral peace corporations, assets are located and where the Aeon of Preservation, Clipoth, is 
most likely chilling and waiting to build his wall. Clipot, if you guys don't know, is actually the chairman of the IPC. <laughs> you, you won't believe me when I tell you guys, but yeah, he is. Or it is. And do you know what he says in their meetings? Build a wall. <laughs> That's it. That's all he says. You're literally talking to a wall that wants to build a wall. Clipoth. There you go. Now, there are a number of planets that are circled around Pierpoint, and these planets are filled to the brim with wood, steel, stone, gold, and everything else piled up on this planetary wasteland of building materials. And in the middle of all that is their Aeon, Clipoth waiting, watching, ever so vigilantly, visualizing his barriers that can only be measured in light years. You know how far one light year is? It's this far. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. What does that mean? Someone tell me in the comments. Here's a quote from the IPC. All the toil and the growth of our capital is for Clipoth and to execute the Aeon's will when the time comes. Yeah, there you go. The IPC's HQ, or peer point. Now onto the fourth planet. Did you guys know that there are actually robot people in the game? And not just ones created by humans either, no. We're talking about an entire planet created by mechanical life. Planet Skrulum, the same planet as the Genius Society, member number 76, Skrulum is from, is a mechanical planet created by so-called Skrulamites. This self-sustaining mechanical planet, if you didn't know, was created by robots for robots. This is a planet with a bunch of holes and squares, a sort of shell of a planet. You can see the core right in the middle. And on this planet's atmosphere, like revolving around it, is the only thing that keeps that planet alive. See, long ago, Planet Skrulum was faced with an energy crisis. Planet Skrulum was running on a finite source of energy, and the life forms living in it were also mechanical beings. So in order to produce more energy and save their planet, they created this huge typewriter. They called it the Celestial Differentiator that endlessly solves equations then serve as energy and a power source for the core of their planet which they also feed into this Differentiator typewriter. The core is a so-called furnace in the middle of planet Skrulum where all the punch data were created and collapsed again and again and again infinitely typing, ever solving, writing this long equation of who knows what it's about. Without this continental typewriter, planet Skrulum will just poof. Interestingly, all the Skrulumites and Skrulum himself doesn't know how planet Skrulum came to be. You'd think because they're mechanical beings, they know or have data on how they were made, but that's not how it went. Every single mechanized thing on planet Skrulum, which includes Skrulum himself, is made of smaller forms of mechanical automaton called cellular automatons, which I could only think of as mechanical cells that are microscopically small that move and build each other, building things together, building Skrulumites, and then these Skrulumites built the planet Skrulum and then at some point built Skrulum himself. And nobody knows how it was made who made them? What was their purpose? The only lead that they have to find that, as well as the origin of the universe, is likely on that same typewriter keeping their planet alive. Nobody knows how this planet came to be. And the one who created the Celestial Differentiator made it with the purpose of finding out the truth of the universe. Not even the truth of why the robot planet thing was there, why Skrulum, why planet Skrulum was there, but all the way to the universe and its origins. That was the reason this typewriter <laughs> was created. Not even, not even humans, any carbon-based life form, aka living thing, doesn't know where they came from. How do you think robots <laughs> knew where they came from? 
Nobody knows where they came from. Not even Skrulem, the smartest person in that planet, who is a member of the Genius Society, the smartest and nerdiest group, the nerdiest faction of Star Rail. He, he doesn't know, and he's still finding that answer. <laughs> also, did you know that in planet Skrulem, there is a mansion that uh, Skrulem lives in, and he drinks this motor oil or <laughs> as his drink in his wine glass. Planet Skrulem, everyone. I really hope we go here. So what happens when a planet spins around the same way it travels around the sun? Huh? You get a planet whose one side is forever in the face of the sun's scorching heat, while the other is helplessly freezing in the darkness of night. See, this is what happened after a really sandy planet named Salsoto was bombarded by meteorites at a certain angle so many times that it changed the planet's rotation. This type of planet is scientifically called a tidally locked planet and is the fifth planet in our list. After the KT event of Salsoto uh, squared, the people of Salsoto had to adapt because of the drastic change in how their planet works. And to achieve that, they had colossal ships, really big ships, city-sized ships. Now in the lore, we were given two ships. One of them was called Tumbleweed and the other, I don't know. So these two ships were made to follow a twilight zone of Salsoto, which was a zone of light and dark of the planet called the Terminator Line, which is actually a real name. They employed skyfishers, which were flying hunters dressed in bird-like armor to fend off the powerful and cold winds of their own gargantuan ships. They would catch and hunt desert jellyfish called phlogiston, which served as fuel to follow the Terminator Line because they need to follow that line for them to survive. And to do that, they need to hunt phlogiston. And to hunt jellyfish, they would risk their lives flying outside of their ships and fighting and hunting these phlogiston and taking care not to murder themselves from how dangerous the actual act of sky fishing is because they were in the sky and, and they were flying in the air fighting these jellyfish. Who knows how big they were. And the same goes for the ship on the other side of the planet, which is also far following the Terminator line. They would sometimes leave letters in dandelion boxes for the other ship to later receive. Now I have no idea how these dandelion letter boxes work, but yeah, they use these letter boxes and then the other ship would then go into the same place which they would soon receive letters from. Now there was a weird point in time in which Salsoto or at least one of their ships started romanticizing the way they chased the Terminator line. They had this bloodline for romanticism and optimism which is weirdly prominent in their lore that I couldn't not include. They called it a dignified life for some reason and not just a survival necessity. They'd sing songs with glass instruments. These instruments were made of glass, which was already quite bizarre and impressive, but could also be engraved with notes and would be used to play songs because of those engraved notes. I'll talk about this special glass later because the Express actually needed it. But the Salsotians were really, and I mean really, optimistic, maybe even arrogant, because they were able to go back to their original day and night cycle, but they also seemed to become very relaxed and seemingly lazy. For some reason, the fight for survival of the two ships chasing the Terminator line with the Skyfishers and all that, it turned and sort of devolved into a poetic ship cruise. And after that, one of the ships, Tumbleweed, soon fell behind the Terminator line and would collide with the other ships because Tumbleweed wasn't moving anymore or because they couldn't catch the Terminator line anymore. Now what's weird in this entry of lore of Salsoto was that when the other ship came into contact with Tumbleweed, it was already a ruined city for some reason. Uh, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe it's just my understanding, but yeah. What's even more weird is that these two ships who used to send letters to each other whose people created their ships weirdly fought each other and used turrets and cannons and started shooting each other until both cities were destroyed. A war broke out and the two floating cities merged together and they all just died. 
For some unknown time, nobody really said, the rotation of the planet returned to normal again, which means the day and night cycle was back to normal. It was rotating properly. But this time, the planet was no longer populated, or at least phlogiston was there. Sometime after that, I don't know when, the Astral Express would go to Salsoto to look for a special material called Cadence Glass, which the people of Salsoto, I think, used as musical instruments. For what use they needed, this Cadence Glass, it was never mentioned. Like, talk to Himiko after fighting Kokolia. Yeah, she, she'll tell you. And along the space of Salsoto, the Express also found Welt, our Welt, Welt Yang, this guy right here, in a huge floating starship. They found a huge starship on their radar and then they thought it was a bandit ship but they still went to it and they found Welt. Himiko never really explained much. It, she just said they rescued Welt using standard rescue procedures and I have no idea what that means. Likely Welt is not related to Salsoto, or I think, because the ships in Salsoto are in Salsoto itself. They weren't floating in space. And the world that Welt says that he was from is vastly different from how Salsoto is. Welt describes his world as a place with forests and seas and everything. He describes it the same way you would describe Earth. And Salsoto is not like that. Salsoto is a very sandy planet filled with deserts and it's very hot at the day very cold at night the temperatures doesn't seem to be normal it's very drastic temperatures in the day and night which is why they had to follow this terminator line it had phlogiston the jellyfish fish things that they had to hunt so i don't think the starship that welt was in is the same ship that salsoto had or at least that's what i think but yeah there you go the weird story and uninhabited planet where we for some reason rescued wealth from uh yeah salsoto this video took quite longer than i expected so i'll discuss more planets in the next one which will include yarilo 6 a condensed version of all of shanzo's ships the planet that himiko was from the blue which is herta's project planet and whatever else i could find along the way but yeah that's gonna be part one of every single planet in honkai star rail i won't waste more of your time so like comment if you enjoyed subscribe for more updates and stay mad theorists bye